So just wanted to welcome you all to the introduction to OpenMP4 CPUs. Uh, thank you for joining us today and a special welcome to our workshop leader uh, who's come from across the across the world, really. We can't get further away. Um, Dr. Ludovic Capelli. And um, yeah, thank you all for joining us in the room and online. Before we get started, we'd like to acknowledge and pay respects to um, the traditional custodians and owners of the land on which Posse and we're sitting right now. That's the Wajak people of the Nomura Nation, and I'd like to pay respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging, and extend that acknowledgement and respect to First Nation peoples around Australia and around the world. With that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, and, and thank you for inviting me and making all this possible, because uh, hopefully we'll see, uh, we'll see interesting things and you'll like it, but none of this would have been possible if and, and pausing in general would have allowed me to come over and share this uh, exciting stuff with you. So yes, this morning we're going to learn about OpenMP for CPUs. I, I'm specifying for CPU because we can also learn OpenMP for GPUs, and that will be this afternoon. So I'll get you part. Um, as always, my slides. I acknowledge the uh, the people from whom I'm inside my part from, so in this case, Dr. Mark Wolf from EPCC and Dr. John Rebellick from uh, the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center and also Carnegie Mellon University, and the software I use. So in this case, Beamer and a uh, package I modified in Beamer to uh, see and diagrams, you'll see that. When it comes to the license, uh, basically all that means that you can do whatever you want to do with it, except selling it or changing it and making it look like I endorsed you to do something different. That's what my slides were showing at first. And this is just a short note to say that um, since it's made for live presentation, there's little text and so on, so I can, I can do the flow of the presentation. So if you want to start it on your own time, these slides are not meant for this, otherwise they would have a lot more text, a lot more explanation, which is less suitable for live presentation. That's why I chose, I chose my slide here. Roughly, We'll go through different teaching blocks made of approximately 20 minutes of teaching and then 10 minutes of practice that allows you to discover, learn and discover each technique and practice them in turn, in isolation. So that we don't go straight into compounds, concepts that are a bit more difficult to cover and to teach and to learn. HPC, parallelization, more parallelization, more HPC. <laughs> That is definitely <laughs> more parallelization, more HPC. No, that's, a, that's good. That's good because um, while other, other people continue to vote, um, this workshop is really designed for people who have no uh, existing knowledge in parallel programming. So if you don't really know anything about shared memory programming, don't worry, that's exactly the type of existing knowledge that is required for this workshop. None. So we're going to really take it from scratch and very gently introducing you to shared memory programming. CPUs, yes, but without computing, oh, okay, district, oh, no. So distributed memory programming is the, um, what we could see the opposite of shared memory programming. We will cover that in the workshops on Monday using NPI. Shared memory will be where um, the different workers we're going to have can physically share the memory, so they are typically the same node. Distributed memory is a different way of programming, typically for when workers will be on different machines and cannot physically share memory because they're just on different computers. So they have to communicate differently. Again, don't worry, we'll cover this on Monday. The two workshops on Monday threads that were definitely going to start there. Stick use. Yes. Okay, that's that's a good that's a good start. Okay, so this is what we're going to go through today, starting with the motivation, which is what are we talking about? Why are we, why are we even interested in shared memory programming in the first place? So let's start with a starting point of <coughs> cup frequency. Do you know? Quick question: Do you know when the first 0.1 gigahertz CPU was? Created because nowadays we have four or five gigahertz and we talk about pet flops and all these things. But at the start, CPUs were definitely not gigahertz. So, do you have any rough idea of when the first 0.1 gigahertz CPU was? 
in chat. You can also check the slide and cheat, but <laughs> the idea is not to do this. <laughs> 1998, so 25 years ago now, quarter of a century. In itself, it doesn't, it doesn't say much. My point is more with what comes next. A year later, we had a CPU with one gigahertz. So it, gigahertz. So it means that in a year, we managed to increase the actual frequency of the clock by a factor of 10. One year later, two gigahertz. So it's still a great improvement, but it's not even times 10, it's times two. A year later, three gigahertz. So now it's not your times much, it's times 0. Well, 1.5, it's so only 50%. To get to four gigahertz, well, it took us a year at a time, right? A year, a year, a year, a year. Well, two years between one and two gigahertz, actually, not one but two years. But between three gigahertz and four gigahertz, 10 years. Why? Because it's hard. <laughs> Long story short, it's hard to get to five, one year later. And do you know when the first six gigahertz was created? Earlier this year. So it's only in 2023 that we had our first six gigahertz without using or something. Uh, six gigahertz CPU. What I mean by this is what we quickly realized in computer science was that we can only increase clock frequency so much. So we thought, okay, um, we, we seem to struggle to increase the frequency. Why? It's because, number one, the higher the frequency, the more the heat loss, i.e. the heat or your components. In itself, it wouldn't be a problem if the heat generated was not reaching a point where your components were melting. It's really how, how hot they can become. And the more physical side of things which I don't have the whole knowledge to explain. There's also a current leak, and when you start making components really, really, really small, which is a direct consequence of increasing the clock frequency or the requirement, of it, you start to have more leakage, which goes beyond what we can control and initially predicted. So we thought, okay, since we cannot increase the clock frequency further, why not try to use multiple cores then instead? And that's how this whole multi-threading Sherman programming happened. At the start, it was a bit drafty. Everybody was developing their own library, their own tools. The problem was it was really challenging for everybody. What I mean by this is, if you were a vendor, you were IBM or you were any company, you're, you couldn't start to optimize parallel programming libraries. Why? Because everybody had their own. So the optimization techniques you were providing for a library were not applicable to another library. And as a user, it was a problem as well. Why? Because every time you would change labs, you would have to recreate your whole program, rewrite everything, and you were not benefiting from the optimization techniques that vendors couldn't develop due to the variety of libraries existing. So what happened is, in the 90s, there's been a, a group of people who thought, okay, maybe we should start thinking of a standardized, standardization process of trying to make one thing, one size fits all, where everybody can channel the efforts towards it. And that became the open EARB. The thing is, so the architecture we do for it, that may sound like something that four people on the planet enjoy doing and they just meet every now and then to sound fancy and no, actually, it's a pretty serious thing. If um, I'm, I'm part of the OpenMP Language Committee, and during one of the other meetings, I just took an attendance check of who was in the room. And these are the companies that were in the room. So AMD, ARM, HP, IBM, Intel, which is and Samsung, Siemens, Type 5 suit. And this list has probably changed already by now. I'm standing with one or two more. That's just the companies will also have now the universities and research labs, which is another whole list with NASA and so on. The second one, the next half of that list is going to sound familiar. So you're in there too. So it's not, it's not people meeting for fun. It's really a worldwide effort that has been going for more than 20 years. So it is a big thing. And that's why it has become one of the major players in HPC. 20 years already. So they never stopped working because I just recently, but it started before I was born. No, I would, actually, after 
But effectively, what the standard is, is a long PDF, which describes everything that OpenMP programs can do, what kind of uh, preconditions your program should have. Current version 5.0, but that's always improving with 5.1, 5.2, 6 in the works, and so on. So now, technical terms, we're going to see two things here. Number one is what we call directed bits. I'm going to explain that in 20, in 20 seconds. And the second part is the full join pattern, which I'm going to explain right after. So let's let's start here in the more technical uh, technical aspects. Of it. The directive based approach. In OpenMP, you will see I'm taking the uh, the the C example here. I will follow the full transform. In uh, in uh, OpenMP, we're going to use special statements. So in C, we're going to use this pragma that we rarely use at all, but it's the same from uh, hashtag include, hashtag define, hashtag pragma. And in Fortran, you will use a special comment. So it's the same type of hint to the compiler that something is happening. This is what we call a sentinel. The sentinel, oh, I didn't put the Fortran, but it's fine, I'll tell the Fortran. In Fortran, it's dollar, uh, except for not dollar, and uh, open MP. When you will see that in the code, don't worry. That tells the compiler, oh, there's some open MP code that's coming. So interpret this and do what my, my directors will tell you. So that's this sentinel here in blue. Then comes the directive name, which is what we're going to unlock today. Directives will be guidance to the compiler to do certain things, such as spotting multiple threads for you, or coordinating them, or protecting their accesses. All that will go through directive names. You will see that in OpenMP, we need very little effort to stop playing with parallel programming. The directive name. Then you have the clauses you can see at the end of the line. The clauses, you can see them as options, which will help tailor the behavior of the directive you just asked for. Again, we will see concrete examples of this, but don't worry. Then, just to be a bit comprehensive, the directive is the full line. So the sentinel, the directive name, and the clauses, the whole line, we call that a directive. And when we put also the code with it, we call that a construct. OK? Five terms, now we're good to go for the directive based approach. And we're going to see our first construct, the most important one, the parallel. So let's take a good old hello world. If we want to parallelize this in OpenMP, what we're going to do is simply wrap it around this parallel construct. So just by adding this Agma OMP parallel, we can put our print as inside it and we'll have power programming and I'm going to have an illustration step by step next slide, so don't worry. In Fortran, since you don't have curly brackets, the open MP constructs work, work by uh, solution mark dollar OMP parallel and then at the end, extension mark dollar OMP end parallel. E -N -D, end. So you have this always starting point, ending point, starting point, ending point. In C, we just use curly brackets. Same thing. Syntactic difference, so no big deal. Let's see what happens really. When you run a program, you have a main thread. So in our case, this print F. Now, when the compiler, and this is where everything begins, where the compiler encounters this parallel construct, this is where it spawns the threads. We'll assume four threads here. The compiler will do that for you automatically. And every single thread will execute the entirety of the code that is between the curly brackets or in Fortran between parallel and end parallel. Every thread will do everything. And you're effectively now having multi threaded execution. Until when? Well, until the end of the parallel region. So Either in C when you hit the, the closing curly bracket, or in fourth one when you when you hit this end parallel. And then after the parallel, you just have only this main thread that resumes execution and continues going. So you start your program with a single thread. You spawn multiple threads here again, just by telling the compiler, please do that for me, just by saying try to parallel or 
going to be parallel in portion. Until the end, you will have more phrases. Okay? Now, this first step here, where we spawn the threads, is called for. You Yes. There is a question. Yes. And I don't know. I'll just raise my hands when it's funny. So, um, how does one choose or control how many threads are spawned? We're going to see that. Ah. You have three ways to, to set it. And the, the 10 second answer to this is you have an environment variable, which we're going to, to learn, don't worry, that will say, okay, every time you hit a parallel construct, you use four threads or 14 or 24. You can also set it to say in your program, inside your program, you can say, okay, from now on, when you see a parallel, it's 14. Then 15 lines later, you can change it and say, okay, from now on, every time you see parallel, it's 25. And the other level is you can say, for this very specific parallel construct, I want two threads. Not the default behavior. If you see a parallel, I want you to do 10 in general, except for this specific one, I want you to use three. So you have three different levels to set it. But again, we will we'll see that. So the first step when we hit this parallel is for the four, and when we end, it's called a join. That is the four join pattern. Okay? So now, assuming four threads, what would be the output of that program? If we are to run this program, yes. It's that four times. Indeed. We'll have that four times. Remember something, or remember, know something, which is let's say the thread zero prints this first line here. Okay. If I run the program again, it might be the one printing in third position. Why? Because all the threads will be fighting to print to the same console effectively, and they may not arrive in the same order every, every time. So you need to learn that your output lines might change. Setting the number of threads, you were asking about it. Here is how you can do it. So this is an environment variable. O of A, P, non threads equal whatever you do. You can put that before the execution of your program, if you want to set this variable just for your program, or you can export it so that it's always equal to the value you give for the duration of your terminals until you effectively close your terminal. So that's the way to set it to the entire program at once. Now, if you want to change it for specific parallel constructs, you can use these clause. Remember the clause thing? I said they were here to give options to the constructs. That's a clause. So when you run your parallel, you pass this option telling the compiler, please, it's all thread, but only two. Things. Just this non thread clause. Now, this, you, you basically overwrite it. OMP non thread designs for the, for the default for the entire program. Except in the in the parallel constructs to which you manually overwrote by saying, oh, I would like two features for this one. Yeah, yeah, the default is still the for the entire program, except for this one. So you can have these two layers. So now, this is how you do it. To set the number of threads for a given parallel construct. You see, just the plus and the value. In OpenMP, you will see that every time it's just one word. This is why this is one of the reasons why OpenMP has become so popular in HPC. One word to spawn the thread, one word to control the number of threads. It's hard to make it much easier. Now you may wonder, okay, that sounds nice, but how do we actually use OpenMP in our programs? We'll just use Flat. It's just one time flat, one word, again. So it enables to support OpenMP in your program. So we'll use GCC in this workshop. Um, so you will see the make files that this flag is already passed to your program. So there's nothing, nothing more to do here. Now, because we're going to have our first, our first data site, the, uh, I need to show you two functions that you will need. Because the example we, we've seen with the hello world is we've just had the thread printing hello world. We don't really know. We couldn't tell which thread printed which line or how many threads in total there were. We can guess it because we've seen four lines, so there must be four threads. But 
with these two functions, you're going to learn how to identify your threads and how to tell me how many threads there are in total. So the first one, ONFD get thread. No? So these are C functions. These are not Padma or something. They are just classic good old C functions. When we get thread none, you get your thread ID. When we get none threads, you get a total number of threads. Don't blame me for having two names that are extremely similar and very easy to confuse. It's not my fault. It was like 20 years before I arrived, but it's there. Now, remember something. Until you hit a parallel construct, you just have one thread in your program, which means if you call and get another thread, you will see one. It's only after the parallel that you effectively have multiple threads running. And then you will see four or something. Now, these two functions, they are, I said, C functions, so like every classic C functions, they need to be included using the include for the library, OMP.h. I think this is already done in the exercises for you anyway. And you will see that yourself very quickly because now it's time to actually have your first exercise. So, in this exercise, the idea is. I'm providing you with a program that prints that line on hello world and thread X. We are white threads. The trick is I forgot how to properly get those values, so for now I just took zero. And the idea is you will have to first spawn many threads, and then for each of these threads to get their thread ID and the total number of threads. So they can tell me, hi, I'm thread 13 and we're 16 threads, or I'm thread 12 and we're 14 threads. And I want every thread to tell me that. So let's see how it goes. So would you like us to start to go through that together? So I'll just use my laptop and I'll just move that. My apologies to our Fortran fellows. I am a C person, even if I can I can also do in Fortran. I did it in Fortran. I was going to paste in Teams. I can show you in C. I think it's what most people use, but I can also easily show you in Fortran if you want. So if there's any question on how to do it in Fortran, I can show you too. Okay, let's increase the font right away. No C C plus plus extension. Thank you. Very much. So what was the first the first thing I had to do here? OK, I need to stand, to stand down. <laughs> what was the first uh, the first thing to do? Initialize. Initialize. Uh, yeah. So what, where are we going to put the pragma? I'm oh, sorry, about the my uh, credits. OK, so the pragma. Okay. First line, online, they're calling it pragma first line. OK. And so what do I put in there? Which which directive, which construct do I use? Parallel. Parallel, yes. So in C we use curly brackets. In Fortran here, you would put n parallel. Okay. So for the uh, for the Fortran version. Okay. Okay, now if I compile my code, and if I run this code. Let's say this to begin with. Okay. Yeah. I'll just show you that here as well. Okay, we're going to increase that top as well. Oh. So if I make it, no complaint here, fine. And if I run it, ah, it's not exactly what we're looking for. Yeah. So we have half the job done. What are we missing? A call. Oh, sorry. A function call. Yes, yeah, a function call. To which which function and for which variable? Because it seems this variable is not set. We don't have the threads picking their ID, so we need threads to pick their ID. What's the function to know our thread ID? What get to now? Yes. OMP get thread. No. By the way. Even if so far it's not correct, you can still see that now we use 32 threads. Mm -hmm. So you are de facto now using multi threaded. You are using parallel programming here. Now let's use it correctly. <laughs> so OMP get thread num will give you will give us our thread ID, 
for the coding thread, okay? And how do I get the total number of threads? Uh, it's a number of threads. Yes. Uh, okay, if we compile again, and if we run again, this time here we go. And we have all our threads telling us that there are 32 threads indeed, and their corresponding ID. So the ID will be between 0 and 31. Yeah. And as I was saying, see, they, they print in what we could call random order. So we have 7, 24, 25 first. But if I run it again, this time it will be 17, 9, 13, because they can all arrive at different times. So this is really how you effectively get parallel programming using, using how many? Yeah, a grand total of three words here and two function call, two function calls. So by not specifying the number, we use by default the maximum number. Yes, the maximum number uh, in terms of the defaults of the environment you're running. So, so if I decided to, like that, often you'll see that uh, if you run on some some systems, yeah. the default will be one. So you'll get one thread only. Right. Like, oh, why am I not getting parallel? Some some places will set up so that the default is one. So that you don't use lots of resources. Here, the default has been set to the total number of active cores on the the node, so you get all thirty-two. Yeah. Because I was going to say, indeed, normally we pick a reasonable number. So typically, we know that when you want to spawn multiple threads, what you effectively want is to get as many cores as well. So you want to get as many threads as needed to use all the cores. But indeed, technically speaking, this is nothing else but a default value to when you know threads behind the scenes. Which might be said to so uh, uh, yeah, I, I have had people complain. I, I mean, I, I was trying this context. People were learning like I can't, I can't get any parallelism, and it's because the default was one. They set more than one. They suddenly saw the parallels. But it's because the default is one. And remember, here if we want to force the number of threads here, if we want to use yeah. 200 threads. We just type this pause, compile, run, and now we have 200 threads. You have more threads than cores. Indeed. Now we reach something interesting, which is we have more threads than cores, which means if you have 32 cores, we won't go into hyper threading right now and things like this. Every thread, every core can run one thread, okay? A thread, by the way, a thread is nothing else than a series of instructions. That's it. So when you write your program in multiple threads, these multiple series of instructions can be given to different workers that we call cores. So they can effectively do it at the same time. However, if you have 200, 200 courseworks and 50 students, and these courseworks have somehow to be done over by all students, the 50 students will, will try to pick up the 200 courseworks that we'll try to share and do roughly four courseworks per student. But some students may be a bit faster, so they may get more courseworks done and so on. So the idea is typically we want to have one thread per core so that we can have one core executing one series of instructions. But at times, I'm going a bit off topic, so I'll be very short here. But at times, that's it. It might be interesting to have this counterintuitive thing of having more threads than core. Why? Because sometimes you need to load the file, for example, a big file. And that time where the thread is idle, while well, the core is idle, because it's just waiting for the, for the data to load, if it had another thread available, then it would pick that thread up and start executing it. And once the file is loaded, it can get back to the other thread. It just provides this kind of flexibility to the core. And that's exactly what your operating system is doing, actually. If you look at your task manager, you will see you have hundreds, if not thousands of threads, and you don't have thousands of cores, because your operating system spends its time picking which thread run for two milliseconds. Okay, that's done. Okay, let's make some progress on this one. That's how it works behind the scenes. But okay, now we have multi-threading with five words. I love OpenFPS. 